This podcast is brought to you by Always Possible. Alwayspossible.co.uk Yeah, you. Come gather. Come closer. I've got something to tell you. In the fast-paced digital world, the role of global entrepreneurship is more crucial than ever. And on the Possibility Club podcast, we're diving deep into how entrepreneurship not only shapes economies and societies worldwide, but also drives the bold leadership and bravery required to address some of our biggest challenges. From economic inequality to tech disruption, the questions that we're looking to find answers to are fundamental to paving the way forward in a digital future. Our guest this episode works at the forefront of digital innovation, a serial entrepreneur, CEO, and founder of More Than Digital. He's a leader in promoting digital trends and exploring how tech landscapes can be leveraged to foster change and drive progress in commerce and in innovation. What does it mean to be a global entrepreneur in 2024? How do new technologies help entrepreneurs tackle big challenges? And what kind of bravery does it take to lead in such interesting, stupid, fascinating times. In this episode, we're exploring these questions with a leader, uh, an entrepreneur, who's trying to redefine the boundaries of business and innovation in different sectors right across Europe and beyond. I'm Richard Freeman. This is the Possibility Club. And my guest this episode is entrepreneur and digital visionary, CEO of More Than Digital, Benjamin Tallinn. Well, hello, welcome to the Possibility Club. It's Richard here. We're here to discuss bravery and the application of big ideas, innovation, risk, change, uh, as ever. But I'm delighted to be joined by someone who knows a lot about this uh, from the front line. Uh, A man who has founded a number of businesses, dreamt up lots and lots of products to take to market in different parts of the world, very much knows the the ups and downs, the rough and the smooth. And that's what I'm very interested to to talk about today, the the, the pains and rewards of entrepreneurialism. And my guest today is Benjamin Tallinn. Benjamin, how the devil are you? Thank you very much. Thanks also for for inviting me. Um, It's really a pleasure there. And where are you calling in from uh, today? Actually, right now in Bulgaria, it's uh, with our team in Bulgaria. So we have a development team here, and that's why I'm calling from not Switzerland normally. <laughs> or let's put it this way: most of the time, I'm in Switzerland for filing my taxes and opening some letters uh, because in the last one and a half years, I need I needed to travel so much between development team, between business development, and so on. So constantly traveling, literally giving up, and so. We are here, uh, speaking of pains, right? So, uh, <laughs> constantly traveling for one and a half years between meetings, between partner meetings. What's the sort of innovation tech landscape like in, in Central and Eastern Europe at the moment? Uh, the overall sentiment is mixed, let's put it this way. We have a lot of different sentiments actually coming together. There is those who actually see the opportunity because it became a big thing to be entrepreneur, to start his own business and everybody's dreaming about it. So in the last years, especially after Corona, people were just like, yeah, let's get the business going because there was a huge surge during Corona in business activity and entrepreneurial activity. And of course, we also had this uh, big hype uh, around all the technology pretty much free money was floating around and just uh, everybody was happy because they got huge funding for just having a little idea and a five-page pitch deck and just saying like I worked for Google for two months and I was an intern there uh, but now I'm tech pro and AI pro Um, so that actually fueled a lot of the hype now there is an awakening so europe is still growing compared to us uh, it's not really that dynamic you're not really that much into this entrepreneurial spirit so you you still have this gap to fill so this is the one trend that the gap is filling and people are starting to actually be more entrepreneurial 
The second thing what is happening right now is actually people are desperate for money because most VCs, they're sitting on a lot of dry powders, so they don't invest, they don't uh, really take companies to the next level. We had just saw actually that um, there was, it was the last quarter of 2023, uh, we had more company uh, bankruptcies than in the whole uh, 2022 together. So there are a lot of startups dying and even big ones, uh, so they don't get like uh, the COD funding. Um, and we see also a lot of down runs. So there is also a lot of pain in the in the whole process because people are starting to lose a lot of money, are starting to burn through all the capital they have. Um, and of course, if you're VC backed, uh, they always tell you like, invest everything, invest everything, you know, be fast, be fast. Um, but if no money is coming up, it's like, ah, oh, you invested everything. Oh, how bad. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Eastern Europe is very entrepreneurial because they have more pain, I would say it, uh, rather than, for example, Germany or Austria. Um, Switzerland is a little bit more uh, compared to Germany or Austria when it comes to entrepreneurial activity. Um, but the problem is also the, the road view. To be honest, I travel so much and it's so different when you actually talk with Americans, uh, when you talk about billions. Uh, and in Switzerland, Germany, Austria, it's rather like, yeah, we dream about one million or so or two million. So the type of dreaming big is way different. Mm -hmm. Is this what you always planned to do? Is this your dream? <laughs> Actually, not really. <laughs> uh, I had my first company with 13, so my first enterprise was with 13. 13. I just, okay. Yeah. Okay. And I just kind of stumbled into it because I was good at what I was doing. I was doing IT marketing stuff. I was literally building server networks. And uh, literally, that was good old time to build servers. So that was my job. Um, I was actually making good money, you know, for a, a small boy who actually got like 20 euros of allowance per month, uh, suddenly having like 300 euros a day. It was kind of good. Um, and yeah, then... After selling pretty much the customers base there with 18, I was going to the US and I started dreaming bigger and I came back and I had the first companies uh, and not even companies. I was just actually, I was coming back to study. I wanted to go into finance. That was back then my idea to go into finance. And in the university, I was just so bored. I was literally just so bored. So I started to go to some entrepreneur club sessions and saw that there is like help to uh, get your startup uh, up and running. And I was just like, yeah, okay, I had a startup. So let, why not think about something else? And then I came up with very, very big ideas. And it was so big that it was already doomed to be actually too big uh, for what I wanted to achieve and what I had adding capital. So I was burning a lot of capital of my own capital for my startup there. And uh, I literally wrote it <laughs> into the ground. Um, then the second uh, startup was also, it was a little smaller, but still way too big. And I didn't really get the game because no product, no funding, no funding, no product, right? And I wasn't really getting the game. And then I was changing it. And then I was just like building my company back uh, uh, around. Uh, I actually built a digital agency because I said like, hey, I'm good at marketing. So I just built that. And from this agency, then a company group, and I did a lot of publications and a lot of change management topics. And I always thought that I'm going to be in the consulting industry. And uh, I always loved turnaround management. And out of the simple reason, because it's just so fun to actually just deconstruct and reconstruct something. And yeah, and then I had my own company incubator. There were actually seven companies in this incubator. It was just a journey of constantly, I see an opportunity and I do it. And I create an opportunity and I leverage it. And actually, the last one was a very frustrating experience also in a way, because I was doing a lot of consultancy. You know, back then, I started smaller so I could help SME companies because they literally had the pain and there you have more freedom to do something. It was more hands-on approach. Um, and suddenly, due to my ex expertise being widely shared and uh, I had a lot of publications that gained a little fame. 
Um, I was suddenly advising companies like Google, Allianz, uh, governments, and you know it's a total different ball game. It's more politics. It's more about uh, make a presentation now, and the next presentation is in six months, and you have this, and we have to stake more of the meeting there. It's not really like do something and change something. It's more like play the game, and you're okay. And I lost pretty much all my my passion for that stuff, um, and I also got so annoyed with all this bullshit thing. So for language here, but, uh, but everything, all this bullshit thing, all this marketing, blah, around digital here and innovation there and AI, yeah. blah, and I was just so annoyed with it. It's not rocket science. You don't need to do much. It's just easy. I, I explained it to you easily. Yeah? It was just, again, frustration. I created most of the companies just out of frustration. And I said, I'm going to make a blog. I'm going to explain all these things as easy as possible, without buzzwords, with all these marketing phrases, without CTAs and uh, sponsor posts and some advertising, whatever. Um, pure information, as I would want it to hear as an entrepreneur. And yeah, this little blog then became what is now one of the top 15 big business platforms in the world. Uh, we are helping now with two and a half million executives worldwide every year. We are doing economic development programs because that's actually what I was doing for governments. But they also didn't want the innovation. They didn't care about innovation. Most of the times I literally had people saying like, ah, that's so different from what we are doing. And I'm like, that's what you pay me for. <laughs> Do you think most people that talk about innovation have the first idea what innovation means? Most of the people think innovation is like, I don't know, building a rocket or so. It's something super, super innovative and you need to radically change the market. The fun thing is actually that more than 80% of innovation is incremental uh, innovation. So you have something, it's an existing market, it's an existing product, and you implement something that is making it better. Mm -hmm. And uh, the radical innovation, that is actually what all the people always think about innovation, um, is actually creating a new market with a new product. Mm -hmm. And that is almost impossible. We are not anymore in, a, in an age we can, where we can literally have radical innovation. We can just build on iterative innovation. For example, AI, everybody is hyping AI, but in the end, it's an algorithm. It's a simple algorithm. And all of these algorithms were actually invented in the 1960s. Um, the only bigger breakthrough of an algorithm was deep learning, and that was in the 2000s. Just getting a little better at understanding languages and a little better at actually building a bigger model to actually have better answers for this model. First of all, we are all humans. I guess that's the first and foremost, the biggest thing we should mention. And we need to understand that besides we wish that the society would be better and we wish that humans would be nicer, we are first and foremost always optimizing our own good. So that's our own priority. And if we understand that, and then we can actually extrapolate it on organizations. Because in small teams and small startups, it's easier to find that everybody works for his own good as the bigger group. You know, if you have five founders, everybody works for himself or his share, uh, but together you actually put in the company. So that is actually opening up more possibilities to actually get a uh, personal wedding in. You cannot be fully agile in an organization because then everything would break apart. Who is going to manage the numbers? <laughs> somebody has to manage numbers. Somebody needs to be responsible for numbers. And of course, if somebody becomes responsible for a very big number, his responsibility is there and he is taking care of himself that he will also in future be taking care of this big number. So he is fighting quite a big thing to actually defend his number. And hierarchy also gives you then pretty much power. And if you have power, you want to be in power and you want to be less in power. So you're not actually very likely to give up the power because somebody else says we have a new thing. That's actually the innovator's dilemma, right? So you're successful at the moment with something and I need to destroy myself. I need to destroy my reputation, something where I'm proud of, somebody that makes me maybe a good bonus and good salary, whatever, and admits that something else will be better and I'm not part of that new thing. It's a very human thing. The size makes it worse, but mm -hmm. it's not that the size is the only determinant in that. 
And of course, uh, the harder it is to pivot. For example, I don't say the name here, a very, very, very large company. I always thought they're super innovative. They're super good at breaking things and putting them together. They actually have one of the biggest digital transformation problems ever created by humans. Because one of the departments is actually so powerful that by just triggering 0.1 growth in this department, it's bigger than 20 other departments compiled. If you have this power, the power leaves somebody to corruption, and then it's actually coming from the inside. Because you cannot give everybody equal rights. You don't have equal departments, you don't have equal budgets, you don't have equal whatever. Um, so somebody will always be a little more right because he can say like, hey, my budget is like 50 times bigger than yours. Why should I listen to you? This podcast is brought to you by Always Possible. But who are we? Always Possible works with ambitious businesses, charities, and public services that are thinking about what's next. From architects to aerospace companies, puppet theatres to primary schools, business networks to big data analysts. If you're wanting to be brave with some big decisions or to be clearer about what to prioritise, then an award-winning workshop from the Always Possible team is a brilliant starting point. We care about just one thing, building ideas that work. For creative, intuitive, and practical expertise, consider Always Possible as your strategic partner. Find out more about how we could power up your mission, visit alwayspossible.co.uk. Alwayspossible.co.uk. This is a quick note to say that the Brighton Paradox will be back. Season 2 will be a shorter, tighter series looking at the energy, impatience and opportunity happening in post-pandemic Brighton & Hove. We're examining the landscape across the city in 2024. What's changing? What's building in economics, culture, community and technology? Why are people telling me that they are in fight or flight mode? What is the significance of a council with an overall majority? How is artificial intelligence maybe changing the way people solve problems in the city? And of course, how has a podcast changed the lives of Brighton's children? And it's not this one. All new interviewees and all new explorations of the city. But right now we're still gluing the jigsaw together, so you'll have to wait a little bit longer. But we are delighted to announce that we're being supported again by Brighton & Hove Albion Football Club, who return as brilliant headline sponsors and partners and the University of Brighton's Help to Grow Management programme also returns as a really valuable project partner. And in addition, we have two new supporters, the exceptional folk at EQ Investors and the legends at Midnight Communications, and we couldn't do this without all of these visionary people. Brilliant. Thank you. Take care. Speak soon. You're painting a picture there of inherent human frailty, I guess, you know, or fallibility. You know, hum- humans will always get in the way of themselves as well as be, you know, gloriously creative and, and imaginative. But I, I, I'm going to argue that there's also a, an innate compassion and, and a need to solve problems that we can do at a scale and with speed and with technology today more than we ever could do in history. And 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 so do you see a shift in the kind of entrepreneur psychology where we are also better at harnessing the power of capital, of technology, of genuine innovation to create greater value than just finance? Do you see any more of that than perhaps there used to be? Or or do you fundamentally feel no? It's still every every person for themselves and 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 will ever be thus. No, it's not just every person for themselves, but uh, it's actually Maslow had a very nice pyramid, right? So he was like, uh, we let we care less depending on uh, how much are we fulfilled. Uh, part of my job as futurist is actually see 20, 30, 40, 50 years into the future. So first question you ask is. Uh, Do we see the positive impact for everyone? Yes, we see it. Actually, there has never been a history or any part of the history where there was 
less poverty and uh, less people starving or less people living pretty much below the super limited uh, poverty line. So what contributed to that is, of course, better factor productivity. So for example, agriculture. Agriculture, once 80, 90% almost of the whole GDP production, pretty much everybody was working in one kind of or another in agriculture, right? Because that's the only way to survive. And right now it's less than 1% of the global workforce and less than 1% of the global GDP. So right now we are super efficient in actually producing something that is a basic need. And that is the same with manufacturing. For years, uh, for almost centuries, you can say, um, manufacturing is in decline. So manufacturing is becoming more efficient. We have more automation. We have bigger plants. We have better processes. We have better materials. So we also the production processes can um, improve. I mean, we can literally have something right now made for $1, which was uh, 50 years ago, maybe uh, $500 of um, labor you would need to put into that. The better we get, the more productivity we'll put in, the better it is. Just imagine, if we just tax the whole world 1%, we could literally feed everyone for free. We wouldn't even need to think about food at all. Just 1% of the global GDP is um, uh, agriculture. So we could literally feed everyone for just 1% of the global GDP. And we literally could give everyone everything from housing to everyone, uh, everything, if we just do 20% of the global GDP for that. And that number of manufacturing will also go down. So if we look into the future, what is happening? Productivity is getting better. We have now algorithms, AI, everybody loves AI at the moment. Um, but we have algorithms. They're making things easier. They're making decisions easier. They're making production easier, whatever. And that will continue to do. And we have also a trend because most of the people who are watching us and uh, hearing us are on a digital device. We are spending around four hours a day just with our smartphone. We can literally imagine a world where you don't even need to buy anything because it's just so cheap to produce that literally everybody can print it or just have it or it's just en masse there. Like now, nobody would need to actually think of food. And that is where we are getting at, that food is just so cheap that people can just afford it and they don't even think about it. Please take it with a grain of salt, what I'm saying. But in the end, when we look really 20, 30, 50 years into the future, we won't just be spending with a 2D screen um, four hours a day, but we will be actually spending with any device. And it can be VR, AR, some brain link or whatever. Uh, doesn't really matter what device it will be, but we will be spending more time in the virtual world. Technology will change the way people perceive money, people perceive freedom, people perceive the social structure, and it will also, of course, have very big impacts on the, the reproduction of ours, because if we have a virtual friend who is actually nicer to me than any real person, then we're also going to have uh, virtual connections, and maybe we don't even need other people. There is a possibility that we create more equality, but also a more dystopian future. <laughs> I can see how there's a democratization of knowledge. And for sure, you know, I, I could only have dreamt when I was a child that I would have the entire history of recorded music or, you know, a, a billion hours of, of cinema and every dictionary, every word, in, you know, in my pocket, in my hand. And my daughter has that and doesn't know any different. You know, that that's staggering how quickly that's happened. But there's also a deep, I don't know. Is there a cynicism or is there a... I could understand people being deeply distressed at this idea of the the real world is so dismal for, for lots of people. We just give up on that and, and concentrate on a virtual world where they can pretend they're in a palace. You know, I think from, a, from an ethical and moral perspective, that's a challenge. For you, do you see the need for a real galvanization of, of entrepreneurialism? You know, so... You know, should we be looking forward to a world in which, you know, most of the population doesn't need to work, as you talked about, you know, because we we should, in theory, be freed up to be able to, 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 to live to our fullest potential. So the logical conclusion of that is that there are billions of, of entrepreneurs, you know, living creative, free lives, or are we almost certainly going to end up with all ownership and technological power 
concentrated in fewer and fewer people i mean you know we are we are we are so far away from that utopia at the moment and every bit of tech that we've discussed is owned let's face it by a group of about four people it's actually funny because I just recently wrote a report and there was uh, part of a work group on that uh, for Middle Eastern government. I cannot say the name right now, but um, they actually asked me what is the future of society and also of uh, pretty much the economy. Pretty much there is everywhere one of the major platforms. If you want to go into retail, you need to pay your fair share to Amazon. Um, if you want to do something on social media, you're paying social media your tax. Um, so we already, we are kind of like a citizen in a platform. And this platform is pretty much taxing you for that. You will be seeing a lot of different people being entrepreneurial in this space. You have an idea, you pump it up, it goes bust. You have an idea, you pump it up, it goes bust. And that is actually the power of social media because you can create hype, you can create a brand, you can monetize it and people get bored. So before you even launch the second t-shirt, people are already bored and there is somebody else doing it. So we're going to see a lot of new entrepreneurial but small entrepreneurial uh, spirit. So people will have the small ideas. They're going to try to test it because, as you said, they have time. They don't really need to do much. So some people will just get basic income and they just need to spend the time and pretty much their basic income on that. Mm -hmm. um, other people will be working on some other services and service-related things. Economy is always evolving. So that means we will always have somebody doing something and creating something that is of value where other people will pay you. I've got one more question, and maybe it's coming back full circle to where we started, but also picking up a little bit from there. You know, if we do have, all have much more creative freedom to be able to start and build businesses, but as you said, we're in a world in which the you know, hype will suggest we've got the next great unicorn and then it disappears. You know, what does that do for the enterprise landscape? Surely it's going to be far harder to get investment. Surely banks aren't going to touch things with a barge pole. Surely it's going to be very difficult to find talent and to build a team. Isn't that, isn't that an unintended consequence of this? Yes and no. I mean, if something is really good and is if this thing is delivering long-term value, it will be also delivering long-term value in the future. But if more people are participating in the market, it actually also becomes harder to deliver long-term value. So you actually see then a little bit more the extremes because you filter out then the more long-term impact things. And then you just have like all this, I mean, what you see in China right now, this super fast entrepreneurial fashion is literally banks are building themselves around these trends. So they literally bank from that. So they literally play poker with it. So it's not that they don't in they're not interested in that because it is making money. And every time somebody is making money, if I can tell you I make a business for one hour and I give you 500 percent return, um, and the chance is like uh, one out of two hundred, then for you as a bank, it actually makes sense. So I just give you the money and I just do it for ten thousand times, um, and it will bring me the return. As long as the industry can deliver that, it will be happening. It's just a different mechanism. On the mm -hmm. other side. We see actually two tendencies, and that is, for example, with fashion. What happened in fashion? Fashion is a very good uh, proxy for that. In fashion, we have fast fashion. So we have the people who are actually don't, they don't give a sh shining <laughs> uh, thing about it. So they just buy this robe. They, they don't even wear it and sometimes just throw it. So we see this super short-lived attention to something and this super low value to something. But at the same time, actually brands like Louis Vuitton, Dior, etc. So the, the long-term brands, they gain way more quality and appearance and whatever because of this anti-trend and that is actually what will be happening also in a, in a lot of ways in an entrepreneurial setting so in a world which is super super fast and where you don't really rely on anything because there is constantly just new 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 so everything is new every hour you have a new startup coming up um, sometimes people just want to de-accelerate so you, you always see this other swing around so there will be a super long-term brands uh, that can monetize on that it's just harder in the middle <sighs> how do you say i mean just look at 1916 70s um, in the u.s um, 
when the first consulting was coming up. It was pretty much always the same copy-paste thing, right? So it was copy-paste how consulting should work. And then in the 80s, 90s, when it was flourishing, you had McKinsey, whatever, coming up. And right now, you see all these super fancy, pansy left and right agencies. Uh, some are just popping up here. Some are just doing that there. Um, there is no common ground anymore. So being normal is pretty much... <laughs> boring. So you need to have either side. And you see that in every industry. For example, for many, many decades, nobody would buy super cheap clothes to throw it away. But super cheap clothes are now common. So you see people just using it like it's worth nothing. And then you have the other trend that Louis Vuitton can suddenly raise the prices for three times and people are buying in bulk. Mm -hmm. As long as the market is not saturated, people will come up. That we, that is what we had with the, all this SaaS boom, software as a service. Everybody had the same model, the same pricing, the same whatever. Um, now we literally see the market splitting up into this AppSumo deal uh, kind of society where it gets built after the year, it's going to drop. Um, so if you just have this quick commerce, uh, I have an idea, I pump it, I dump it. Um, or the people who are actually building long-term things. I mean, somebody to compete with Office is almost impossible right now. Google tried and succeeded in some way, but it's not the full Office yet, right? So, and uh, competing with that is hard. And that's like the Louis Vuitton of the software industry. And I guess that will be also true for a lot of other industries that you see when they're coming up, there will be a lot of averages. There is one peak that is literally concentrating the power and for the rest, it's then free game and you need to differentiate yourself. Mm -hmm. That's actually the fun thing with every social media we have seen. At the beginning, everybody gets a lot of reach. And then at the end, if you're, if you're late, for example, LinkedIn was the same. If you're right now starting with LinkedIn, it's almost impossible to get to 30,000 followers. My friend told me that um, he had actually 10,000 followers within like seven days when he started with LinkedIn, when it was freshly out. Um, so just imagine right now, 10,000 followers on LinkedIn, that is, that is almost like 10 years of work to get that. You know, the danger with all of that is that there's no depth, there's no quality. It's just perpetually driven by a kind of a need to move rather than a need to be really good. Where your skill is, and, and listeners will be fascinated by this, is it's just understanding it, being an analyst. We all need to be better analysts, really, to be able to, yeah. to work out how it all how it all plays. But it's also hard. I mean, to be honest, uh, I spent so many days and hours in just doing that. Every day I spent like two, three hours just ed educating myself, understanding the thing. It's natural what it is. It's just maybe how the brain was wired for me. Uh, maybe I'm just weird, can also be. Um, but for me, it's always like I hear something, I need to think what is the impact, uh, what will be happening afterwards. Uh, if I don't know it, I need to Google it, I need to understand it, I need to see the consequences. Yeah. Because, you know, in complex systems, you usually say like this is combined with A and B and C and C is combined with X, Y, Z. So you're just trying to actually map out what is happening there. Mm -hmm. But what a lot of systems change, for example, is missing these productivity gains or, for example, um, these marginal gains, whatever. So you have a lot of these, these intricate things, which is in every single node, uh, not being covered. And they have a huge potential because something positive can suddenly or negative if the market is actually saturating. Yeah, we need to educate ourselves more on these things, but it's super, super, super complex. And I'm also, I'm, I'm coming to a maximum of my mind um, of doing that. And it takes me weeks to actually just think through because if a government gives me one of these challenges, how to actually predict something, how to actually look at things, um, it's just so many thousands of variables and so many thousands of possibilities, uh, dependencies, etc. And formalizing it, it's hard. That's why, yes, understanding the future might be good, but most people don't have the time. Try to write down pretty much what is the worst that could happen. So what is the fallout? What is challenges? What are some negative things that could happen? 
try to map out what is the positive things, and then pretty much just combine everything into a single table and prepare yourself. So you're actually, by combining it, you have from the different scenarios that are relevant for you, you have at least then something that you could either use as an opportunity. So it's like a SWOT analysis of your future. And always, please, if you do something like that, just use the resources you have. And don't forget something as a resource is very valuable. For example, your industry expertise, your friends. People always forget what resources they have. They have a friend circle. They have some expertise in the friend circle. Um, and the same is also with a company. For example, I once was actually advising a carton producer. You know, this pop-up display producers there mm -hmm. uh, for the pharmacies, etc. So they produce all the, the stuff where the cosmetics and the... Mm -hmm. uh, pharma products are being sold. They didn't know actually one of the greatest things they have. So they couldn't even anticipate the future because one of the greatest assets they had was customer attention. Their displays were in front of millions of customers every day. But the only thing they were focusing on is actually how to make cheaper carton and how to print cheaper uh, mm -hmm. and how to make maybe a flexible carton to do whatever bending stuff. Um, but they didn't actually understand that actually the big assets they could have is customer attention. And by just attaching a screen there and maybe just attaching a little camera or tablet, uh, is camera and screen, right? Um, they could actually track what kind of advertising is working, what kind of colors is working. So they can literally upsell on that. They can literally rethink the whole business model. Instead of selling a carton, they could suddenly sell attention. Try to think outside of the box. And that's the biggest challenge I see in all entrepreneurs. Thank you. Oh, wow, lots there, lots there. Um, <laughs> and some, and some, good, some good takeaways. Thank you so much <laughs> for spending some time on the Possibility Club, uh, Benjamin Telling. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for listening to the Possibility Club Practical Bravery. If you enjoyed this episode, do like, share, review, tell everybody about it. Look in the show notes for all the details of today's guest, stuff we talked about, stuff that's of interest, new things to read, new things to listen to. And if you are running a business or a charity and you are trying to accelerate or improve the impact that you have in the world, if you want to be famous for what you do and what you change rather than just what you sell, then talk to us alwayspossible.co.uk We want to hear from you, we want to talk to you, we want to amplify and elevate your ideas and who knows, we might be able to help you feel more confident and clear about what's next. alwayspossible.co.uk We'll be back in a couple of weeks with a new special guest and a new insight on practical bravery in action. The Possibility Club is an always possible podcast. The interviewer was Richard Freeman for Always Possible and the producer and editor was me, Chris Thorpe Tracy, for Lo-Fi Arts. Have a good week. Alwayspossible.co.uk Lo-Fi Arts